Hello and welcome to this session on Purple Martin Dispersal. Uh, thanks for joining us and thanks to the Purple Martin Conservation Association for facilitating this conference. Great job. Uh, I'm a professor of environmental science at the University of Alberta. I'm Glenn. Uh, I want to introduce my co-authors, Carolyn Cook, who was a student a few years ago completing an independent studies project on this topic. Jeff Holroyd is the chairperson of the Beaver Hill Bird Observatory. Hardy Pletz is a bird bander extraordinaire. And Myrna Pierman is an environmental educator, uh, formerly from the Ellis Bird Farm. Uh, the topic that we're covering today has been published in Western Birds. So you can see the uh, citation down below if you want to learn about more of that. I'm speaking today from Central Alberta, which is Treaty 6 territory with uh, Indigenous peoples still active and uh, important in this area. All right, let's take a look at the role of age and sex in needle and breeding dispersal for purple martins. So uh, there's a lot of important characteristics of purple martins, of course, and uh, we don't need to talk about all of those. The important part for this one is that the population is in decline, and we need to know a little bit more about how purple martins disperse across the landscape in case they need to expand their range in light of various threats. So the question is, why would a purple martin disperse or not disperse? There are a lot of good advantages of dispersing. Uh, one would be to uh, mix up the gene pool. And so if they continuously come back to the same area, uh, mixing with the same genes, that could lead to inbreeding. Uh, dispersing could lead to new resources, uh, better access to flying insects and so on. Uh, it could be driven to dispersal by a former nest failure or a, a breeding failure that could uh, cause them to move on. And it could be that there are better population dynamics in some of those new places. But we all know that purple martins, and this is one thing that we enjoy, is that they return to uh, similar areas. So they're imprinted on uh, those local areas. They learn in those areas and they enjoy coloniality in the places that they experienced previously. And of course, there's safety in numbers. And that can uh, be attained by returning to a place where there are no, there were numbers there. So advantages and disadvantages. There are two different kinds of uh, dispersal that we should look at. The first one is natal dispersal. Natal dispersal is uh, referring to how far a bird travels from its birthplace to where it breeds for the first time after its first migration. That's different than breeding dispersal. And so uh, breeding dispersal is the distance between breeding sites in successive years. So from birth to the first breeding site, uh, natal dispersal, afterwards, that would be called breeding dispersal. All right, so a few uh, bits of information from past studies that's relevant to dispersal. First of all, uh, other folks have found that females prefer mature males. And that will play a role in how far they move or if they move from previous uh, breeding sites. Males disperse further, past research has shown, and females have a lower survival rate. So that if they um, perish, that will uh, be reflected in uh, the lack of data for um, subsequent years. So we wanted to ask about sex. Does it affect Martin dispersal in Alberta? Similarly for age, past research has shown that uh, the ASY, those are the older birds after second year, they arrive on the breeding grounds before the younger birds, the second year birds. And so they have a better choice and they can make a decision about dispersing or not. The younger females have the lowest survival rate, they're inexperienced, and the younger males have the lowest breeding success because the older males arrive first and establish breeding territories. So our question was, does age structure influence Martin dispersal in Alberta? Okay, let me take you to Canada. That's the country to the north of the United States. Alberta's in the west in green, and our study area was this block in black. Uh, it comprised about 10,000 square kilometers. Uh, we focused on existing colonies that had success in attracting purple martins, and where there was, uh, in most cases, some previous banding so that we could take advantage of knowing uh, when uh, birds were banded and um, uh, we could catch them again to learn about where they have traveled since banding. And we did field work in 2017 and 18. Here's what we did. We found some existing colonies. We located banded birds by standing back and watching with scopes and binoculars. 
when we located uh, a few of those, we would lower a house, attach a puck board, attach a string. You can see strings lowering down, uh, attach it to the pole, and then out 10 or 15 meters. And we would wait until a bird with a band uh, overcame any uh, discomfort about going in the hole. And once it was in the hole, we pulled on the string and closed that uh, little door. And we could lower the house and access the bird, read the band, and carry on. So we recorded its age after learning about its origin. And we could look, look at it, whether it's a second year or after second year. If we had banding information, we could look at uh, the number of years at a minimum uh, that it was. We had a six-year-old bird show up. If possible, we would look at uh, sex and we recorded the recapture location and we could compare that to the original banding location. We had similar data for across Canada and that went back for many years. And in do gathering all those bits of information, we could calculate the dispersal distance in kilometers and the dispersal direction in eight categories, the cardinal directions and four in between. We had to do a little bit of cleanup uh, because the populations that we accessed possibly included um, individual birds from uh, the Western subspecies. So we excluded BC populations, that's British Columbia. We didn't include fledglings. Sometimes the mistakes were made. Other species were included in the data set from uh, the banding office and we excluded bands with no recorded data. We should be aware of some limitations here. Some of the records that we had have missing age or sex data, so we couldn't do much uh, in terms of making comparisons. Uh, we only assessed landlord colonies. Were there differences in dispersal? We don't know. We only accessed a small area in Alberta. Uh, the larger Canada-wide data set had uh, more information, but it had a lot of missing uh, parts to it. Took a lot of time, low recapture rate, and some banding locations were only estimated. So we had to live with those limitations. So let's uh, compare what we have found. Remember, we made uh, have two data sets to compare. One is Central Alberta, and one was the Cross Canada uh, data set from the bird banding office. For the years, we focused on 2017 and 18, but across Canada, uh, many decades worth of data. We were able to uh, capture 161 birds, and of those, we could use 153 for analysis. In Canada, the data uh, were much um, uh, more messy, so we could only use 38 of the 397. The percent dispersal was similar, 36% for Central Alberta compared to 29% for Canada. Uh, the average distance was not comparable because the, the study area was different. So in Central Alberta, with that limited 10,000 square kilometer area, uh, the maximum was 24 kilometers compared to 183. The maximum was 82, limited by that area, over 1,000 for Canada. And that was an older male, 2015 to 17. This was an older female back in the 50s. The most common direction for dispersal was to the northeast uh, or east in both cases. All right, let's compare age and sex here. Here's a table. Uh, we're going to focus primarily on the Central Alberta data set because the numbers in Canada were lower. In brackets is the expected number of individuals that would have uh, dispersed. And you can see for uh, young second year males, there was a higher incidence of dispersal than was expected. Uh, similarly, for uh, older males, there was a slightly higher incidence of dispersal. For females, it didn't uh, shift much. Uh, for um, second year birds, 12 compared to expecting 9.7 and after second year here. So overall, we can see uh, that age was an important determinant. Second year birds dispersed more than expected and compared to after second year birds and males uh, dispersed more than expected compared to females. All right, in terms of distance, you can see here the older females dispersed not a, um, this were less likely to disperse. You can see that in this chart. This is no dispersal to zero. But uh, once uh, dispersal happened, the distance increased. So sec, um, younger males, this bar here uh, indicates that they were more likely to disperse and then they can uh, show up at this distance here. Anyway, most uh, many birds uh, stayed put. 
and then those that disperse show up on this chart here. Most disperse just a short distance, you can see here. For Canada, with fewer uh, data points, it's a little harder to discern, but again, most uh, stayed put and a few are dispersed. Okay, let's look at this by uh, distance, uh, by age and sex cohort. So for Central Alberta, we compared this data set with these four groupings, the younger males, the younger females, the older males, and the older females. These little letter, uh, letters from a statistic point of view show that there's a difference. So the only difference that showed up were older females dispersing a greater distance, 39.8 kilometers on average, compared to younger males. They dispersed a shorter distance, which was interesting. Um, we, would have, we knew that females, older females, uh, were, have high site fidelity, stayed less likely to disperse, but when they did disperse, it was a longer distance. Overall, the natal dispersal for those younger birds with only one year under the belts was just a short 17 kilometers. For older birds, when you add natal and breeding dispersal together, it added up to an average of 30 kilometers. Okay, in uh, terms of direction, most birds dispersed to the east and to the northeast, and there was no difference between ages and sexes in that regard. The same shows for Canada, but the numbers are, are much lower, but there was no difference in age, sex, uh, age or sex cohort by direction. All right, so based on that, what can we conclude? Well, uh, the dispersal rates were as expected. The males dispersed more than the females, and the males preferred older male, um, females preferred older males, which arrived earlier. The older females had the lowest dispersal rate, but once they did disperse, they went a little farther. Uh, most of the younger birds did disperse. They had are at a disadvantage. They arrived later. The breeding sites are, are already claimed. Um, a good 29% of older birds also dispersed uh, from their natal sites, but some of them then returned to their natal colony, which is interesting. So that takes a, a two-year stepwise period. And remember, that's the important part of the timing of their return. The older males first, and then the older females, and then the younger birds. Overall, the distance was interesting. Uh, it was comparable. There were some of the study area effects of our, our small study area, and there could have been some additional dispersal beyond that. In terms of direction, uh, east and northeast were the most common, and so we'll talk about that in a second. And do remember the limitations of, of these kinds of studies. So just to wrap up here, uh, Purple Martin conservation uh, is affected by our understanding of dispersal. So remember that there are benefits to dispersing. Um, we appreciate the, that they return to our backyards every year, but uh, dispersing allows for a mixing of genes, allowing them to access new resources, and there could be some population of dynamic advantages of dispersing. But what about the impacts of climate change and access to resources? What about habitat availability, especially nesting sites? The big question is, can Martins respond to those changing dynamics. Well, if dispersal is important to respond to climate change, they will need nesting sites. Nesting sites and appropriate nesting conditions are provided by you as landlords. So we need to provide nest boxes and appropriate landlord efforts in the directions that they are likely to disperse in order to expand the range to respond to climate change and habitat change. So we need to look at the distance and direction and perhaps uh, follow through with the provision of our nest boxes in the right places at the right times. Lots of potential for future research. Uh, what are the benefits and costs of dispersal? What about nesting success, the weight and conditions of young? New technologies like MODIS, can we track them throughout their uh, dispersal period, especially on the breeding grounds throughout? What about other variables? Um, uh, the kinds of nests involved, uh, how fast is climate change happening and in what directions at the local scale? And can we effectively assist dispersal if needed to uh, increase range through appropriate housing and landlord care? All right, that's it for me. Uh, thanks especially to all these landlords that provided access to their houses. Thanks to some research assistants uh, that helped out throughout the collection period. And I wanna thank you for joining me on this session. Thanks a lot, take care.